Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. We're proud to present our next speaker, Chris Placell from Red Knight. Please give him a warm welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to a session on Amazon Workspaces. We're going to talk for a few minutes about top tips and tricks for deploying workspaces in a production environment. So the intro, real quick. Um, we're going to cover five of the common tips, tricks, um, misconceptions about deploying workspaces in a production environment that we've seen from the field. I'm doing some deployments. Uh, Red Knight Consulting is, a, is an Amazon partner, and we focus on being a managed service provider, and especially in the workspaces um, uh, product set. So expectations coming into this session, what we're expecting is that you already kind of understand what a virtual desktop is, you have some experience, and, and understand um, how a virtual desktop would work in your environment and uh, how it would connect to your existing applications and servers. So we're kind of going at a medium level just to set expectations. The number one thing that we see when we're deploying workspaces in a production environment is customers make assumptions about either either deploying workspaces as a virtual product or not deploying them using a bunch of assumptions and cost justifications. And there's a few mistakes that we see customers very commonly use uh, to, to analyze this product set. The first thing is it's going to be easy. We can just click the button, turn it on, and deploy it, and it's going to work. And at the end of the day, they're still Windows desktops. Um, and so uh, the challenge with managing Windows desktops still exists. So you need some sort of product or platform that's going to help you still do patching, monitoring, uh, and, the, and, and controlling those desktops. It's, uh, a big misconception is customers are just going to turn it on and give users access to it, and it's going to work. Your applications still need to get deployed to these virtual desktops, and they need to be configured. And there's a lot of work that goes into that. The other, the other thing is um, they need to be domain joined. So, if you don't connect these virtual desktops to your domain, if you're running a Windows environment, they're not going to be able to be controlled with group policy, with Active Directory, and get your applications deployed to it. So many customers misestimate um, how long and what effort it takes to get connected to Active Directory, and then what Active Directory components are manageable through workspaces. The other thing, many times customers go into um, a workspaces deployment thinking they're going to use their existing Microsoft licensing. At a large scale, a customer might have an enterprise agreement. Um, and generally, our experience has been that assumption that you can bring your own Microsoft licensing into the Amazon workspaces environment is very hard to justify. Um, generally speaking, you probably aren't licensed correctly and don't have the, the right software assurance, um, usability rights to use it in the cloud. So in these ROI justifications, we see customers say, we're going to use the less expensive workspace and, and get away with doing that by bringing in our own Windows, uh, uh, Windows 10 licensing. It's very complicated to do, and we strongly recommend that if you are going to consider workspaces, that you select the bundles that already have the Windows licenses included and put that into your ROI model so that you're correctly um, getting numbers out that are going to make sense. Um, the other thing is people assume that the costs are going to be cheaper for running a virtual desktop. The challenge with this is the virtual desktop still needs to be controlled and run in the same, um, in the same way that a physical desktop needs to be. And if you don't put the right effort into a team of people that are going to manage it, how you're going to control it, support calls are still going to come in, um, you need to uh, allocate for that. Compared to an on-premise environment, security and redundancy and reliability, they all are a factor. So just the opposite of all those limiting factors I just mentioned, there are some benefits that people don't put into their ROI models, such as the infrastructure behind the scenes with Amazon Workspaces is all highly managed by somebody else. So if you're running a virtual desktop environment like a VMware or a Citrix or a terminal services or remote desktop environment, you're having to manage that hardware, that infrastructure, the support and warranty that goes along with it, and all that hardware, that cost justification of building redundant data centers, having the data replicated, that needs to go into your ROI model. And many customers misjustify the costs uh, and, and think that virtual desktops are too expensive. And in reality, you're going to be creating a much more reliable and secure environment when you do deploy workspaces correctly. Um, and that needs to go into your ROI model. 
The other thing we see very commonly customers make mistakes on is they're going to just use their existing endpoints. They're going to just continue using their desktops. And that's fine. That is a great transition uh, a model. You can put the Amazon Workspaces client on any desktop, um, Windows and Macintosh. We see it all. But what happens many times is those customers will neglect those endpoints now and treat them like dumb terminals or dumb endpoints. If you're going to continue to run that, that endpoint as a Windows desktop, let's say, you still need to license that desktop, patch it, manage it, support it, um, and make sure that there's antivirus on it, and run it like a second desktop. So in the environment where you really do run a physical desktop and a virtual desktop, you're really now running and supporting two desktops. So we suggest that customers, when they look at this, have in their roadmap or their plan considering some sort of zero client. Um, and a zero client is basically just an endpoint that can connect to the cloud. It has no operating system on it whatsoever. It has no ability to be patched or updated. It can't get a virus. It doesn't have any moving parts on it. And they're very inexpensive. You can get them at the low end for a couple hundred dollars. And at the high end, they support uh, four monitors now at, at 4K resolution. So we see them in financial services and trading, um, um, healthcare, high resolution uh, AutoCAD, rendering, SolidWorks, that sort of things. So they are, they are supported by um, the limiting factor isn't the application anymore. And it really cuts down on the management and maintenance. Uh, you guys may notice if you've been to the labs here, the Amazon uh, labs, they're all run on zero clients. So they were able to stand up, I, I believe there's six or 700 endpoints in there on workspaces, create virtual desktops on zero clients, and they're going to tear it all back down at the end of the week um, with, a, with a very limited team. So, um, there's no second desktop to support, and they're green, right? They have much, much less energy consumption. There are even a handful of um, um, PoE-supported zero clients, so you can power them right from your network switches. So they consume much less power than something with a moving fan and a moving hard drive. And the deployment can be handled very easily through many of the manufacturers have management consoles. So if you need to roll out hundreds of these, you can basically unbox them, turn them on, and they'll patch themselves and come online. I mentioned earlier that it's really important to treat the virtual desktop like a Windows desktop still. You still need to do all the same management things. Many customers will deploy these workspaces, turn them on, and never look at them again. At a small scale and small businesses, which is where we mostly um, are, are interacting with folks, um, they won't patch them, they won't put antivirus on them, they won't put any sort of active directory group policies in place to control them. Um, and that's a mistake because they're susceptible to the same problems that a regular desktop would be, um, getting viruses, uh, having performance issues, monitoring. You need to be able to monitor performance on them. And there are some great tools that are out there for monitoring the performance, the end user performance of this virtual desktop. There are specific group policy uh, configuration settings for the PCOIP protocol. Many people don't realize they exist, but you can control things like uh, clipboard, copy-paste capabilities, um, uh, printer remapping, drive remapping, um, and many other functionality inside the group policy. So there are group policy-specific settings to um, the Amazon workspaces, and even more specific ones uh, all the way down to the zero clients. The other thing um, that many customers are uh, considering and implementing is multi-factor authentication. So in order to have a secure desktop environment, you're enabling people to log in from anywhere, to work on any device. And the benefit there is great. Now, now your people can work from anywhere. But how are you ensuring with a simple login and password that that user really is who they are, their credentials haven't been stolen? And there's many different products on the market. But one of the things we see customers miss very frequently is considering at least some sort of multi-factor authentication. And there's many, many vendors, as I was walking around here, I saw supporting this now. Workspaces natively supports it. Um, it's important to roll it out and have it as part of your plan during the initial rollout so that it can uh, be architected correctly. Um, and there's some important considerations around if you're using zero clients, how MFA, multi-factor authentication works, um, and mobility, how, what kind of tokens you're using. Uh, and that's important as well. But at the end of the day, you need to treat this just like a managed desktop in a large enterprise organization if you have hundreds of desktops. You need to have some sort of tool. Of, we refer to it as an RMM tool, remote, remote management and monitoring tool, that allows you to screen share, allows you to reboot systems, um, control, uh, collect data from them on how they're performing. So you still need to treat them like a regular desktop. 
The other thing that we believe is important and a mistake a lot of customers make when they're deploying workspaces at scale is they're just using the native billing tools that are built into AWS. They're great. They do give you some information. There's some basic cost exploring stuff that, that exists in there. But you can plug in third-party tools, and there's ways to get them for free that give you really, really detailed billing analytics information about how your workspaces are being used. So as an example, we were working with a customer, and they had a workspace. Uh, they had 14 workspaces that were idle for 30 days. They just weren't even logged into for 30 days. And that customer was paying for those workspaces. They had no idea that nobody had logged into them. From the Amazon console side, you see a workspace with a username on it, but you don't necessarily know that it's idle and there could be a cost savings there. Um, so it's really important to have some sort of billing management tool or platform that's external to Amazon. Um, and it'll give you data about unused or idled sessions, uh, bad logins, the health of your workspaces. Um, they're just starting to, to expose some of the um, healthy, unhealthy statistics through Cloud Checker now, and, and some of these third-party monitoring tools are starting to pick them up, which is really important. But whether or not you log into a workspace or if it's over or underutilized, you pay for it. The first of every month, that bill, that bill hits your um, Amazon usage. Unlike uh, many other services in Amazon, you pay 100% upfront for that um, and not as you use it over the month. The other thing the billing tools help you manage is um, by department billing. So um, we had a use case where we had a financial services customer, and they wanted to bill back different locations. So they tagged each of their workspaces by location and rolled it up to a bill, and now they can break out the bill for those workspaces by location and actually break out the cost of those workspaces and build them back to a division, a department, or a location. And again, that's something you don't get natively in AWS. You can set the tags, but being able to report on them automatically is, is uh, an external feature. Picking the right bundle for the workspaces. Workspaces are broken out into several bundles. They've just added some new ones. Um, the controlling factor here for most of the customers that we see is RAM. How are the applications on those desktops going to utilize the, the, the RAM memory in the workspace? That's usually the deciding factor on what workspace you're going to go to and creating bundles around those. But you need to do extensive, extensive testing with your application set. You know, someone says they use, they use Excel. How are they using Excel? Are they using giant data sets? And really test that. Because if you get this wrong on your initial deployment and you roll it out at scale, you now have to unroll all those bundles, fix them, and roll them all back out again. So it's really important to size these correctly. Also, uh, as of January, they started deploying solid state drives inside the workspaces. And that was a new feature. A lot of customers were excited about it. But one of the most common misunderstandings was if you didn't recreate your bundle and redeploy that out to your clients, you didn't get those solid state drives. So you had to actually tear down uh, end user desktops and rebuild them uh, to get the, the new functionality. Uh, the, other, the other interesting thing that we like to point out is there are benefits to using partners. There's a lot of really smart customers out there. You guys will all figure it out by clicking around and turning things on and off. But I always make the analogy that I can give 10 people a recipe for cookies and the ingredients, and you're going to get 10 different cookies. Only someone who consistently does it over and over and over again is going to be uh, able to deploy it at scale with the knowledge. There is some value in having experience. And partners have access to things like proof of concept funding, where we can actually get funding from Amazon to run a workspace at scale for you for a period of time, or get access to demo equipment uh, so that you can actually try this stuff at no cost before you actually have to commit to buying it. Uh, and also, we get better access to Amazon resources. So there's lots of partners out here on the floor. And one of the benefits of being a partner is we have direct access to their architects, the engineers, and the staff that control workspaces. So instead of being stuck behind a ticketing portal, we, we can call them up directly and, and get help with uh, problems, issues, at scale deployments. And that's it for the presentation. I'll be here for a few minutes uh, standing around uh, to the side, answering any questions if you guys have any uh, questions or comments about workspaces. Thank you.